Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, and each officer and member of this church. We're just blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. As always, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications. You'll get all of our content, our Bible study each Wednesday at 6 p.m., where we're currently going through the book of Galatians, and our Sunday morning worship service, uh, where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven from our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. Our lesson today is entitled, Build Yourselves Up. It's taken from the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter, so the book of Jude, the 17th through the 25th verses. And our key verse is Jude... Uh, the 20 and 21st verse, it reads, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so our goal today, first we will examine the tension created when Christians' value, uh, values clash with societal values. Secondly, we will identify times when God restored us and trust in him in a much more deeper way. And then third and finally, we will commit to building faithful practices that reflect the restorative work of God within each and every one of us as believers. And so I'm really excited about this book, Jude. Uh, I, I tend to use the 24th and the 25th verses. The last two verses of our lesson is the benediction whenever I'm allowed to dismiss a worship experience. Uh, and, and it's just a really good book. It's the second to last book in the Bible right before Revelation. And it's meant uh, to really prepare believers uh, for the challenges that we face as we move forward in ministry, not just external challenges, but even in internal challenges within the body of Christ. And so we'll begin with prayer, and then we'll jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for another opportunity to study your word. We confess that we've fallen short and made mistakes, but we thank you that you continue to give us brand new graces and brand new mercies each and every day of our life. Now, as we break into your word your bread of life. Help us to see you in a much clearer way that we might understand your will and your purpose for our lives. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your darling and precious son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So our lesson is broken into five different sections, and we'll jump right into it. The first section is in the 17th and 19th verses of Jude, and it's entitled, To Be Forewarned is to be forearmed. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. The text reads, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having spirit. So our lesson begins with the author urging the listeners to recall the warnings that were issued during the early days of the church. The book of Jude addresses issues of spiritual warfare in the early church as believers experience opposition and interference from the enemies of God. Jesus, concerned about the well-being of his disciples in John 14, 15 through 21, he promises that he would send them a comforter to protect them from the evil and the dangers of this world, that we not be removed from the world, but that we be protected while we're in the world. This was the prayer of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at the work and the, the, the desire of Jesus to not remove us but protect us, we understand that even before Christ uh, was crucified, before he ascended into heaven, there was an understanding and a recognition that we were not able to face these challenges on our own, but that God would give us what we need to stand strong. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, Paul warns Timothy about people that will not listen to godly teaching, that will turn away from the word of God. So the ignorance of non-believers and the rejection of God's word was not new to this audience. Since the origin of the Christian faith, many have heard and rejected God's word, and many have turned away. As time continued to pass, early believers and even doubters of the faith looked at the continued Roman uh, oppression, the suffering of, of the saints, the crucifixion of the apostles, and the time that has passed since the death of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection, uh, as, of his resurrection and ascension, as reasons to doubt or question certain aspects of the gospel message. They really struggle with, now that we're Christians, we've heard what Jesus promised us, but why does our lives, why do our lives not look better than what they did prior to our, 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 our faith, prior to us giving our lives over to Christ? And there was a sense of immediacy in the expectation of deliverance and of the promises of God in the lives of, of, of believers, and they begin to wonder, well, since things aren't happening right now, 
did we make the right choice? And then that's when these false teachers, these false uh, teachings begin to creep into the body of Christ. So these people that have rejected or turned away from God, God's message, they not only ignore its truth, but then they began to mock and insult the people that submitted to God's will and followed God's word. The people that Jude warns his listeners about intentionally use areas of uncertainty or uh, areas that weren't as clear as they are in the 21st century church to create doubt and fear in the lives of believers and followers of Christ. When we look at the gospel of Christ through the 21st century lens or our own perspective, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of preaching, of teaching, and theology, all which is readily available to us thanks to the advances of technology that God has provided. We can actually look for free and read all the summaries of each council, the Apostles' Creed, some of the early writings of Augustine, and, 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 and we have a, a much clearer understanding of theology because of our access to uh, information. During the time that this epistle was written, and, and in the early church, there was no written version of the Bible, very few testaments of the Old or Testament books, very few copies, excuse me, of the Old Testament books were available, especially outside of the temple system, and then Christian education was at its infancy stage, uh, 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 and that's kind of putting it mildly. There was very, there was an absence of Christian education, uh, and people really struggled to ascertain knowledge and understanding in the word of, of Christ. Outside of word of mouth and visiting apostles, many believers in the early church operated by faith with only a basic knowledge of intricate theological topics like the resurrection, salvation, and the inclusion of Gentile believers in God's plan of salvation. Now, taking advantage of this lack of certainty within the church, the enemy busied himself by sowing seeds of division with the opposition to the early church, distorting, confusing, and flat out lying about the work of Christ and the responsibilities of believers. Now, this warning that Jude gives is not based out of fear, but rather out of preparation. The church should be prepared for the challenges that we will face so that we will not be derailed in our work or in our faith when we encounter them. Regardless of your uh, concentration, each seminary student is required to take a class called Systematic Theology. The coursework uh, uh, goes through different theological disciplines and helps each student to understand and decide where we stand on issues regarding gender, prophecy, angels, demons, sin, Satan, resurrection, and salvation. The perseverance of the saints, countless other topics are, are discussed. Uh, the reason why, they're why each student is required to take this class is because as we move through ministry and we begin to share the gospel in a more holistic way, as we seek to answer questions of the congregations that we serve and we face challenges in our own Christian education, we must not only be, we must not only be prepared but at the same time, we must understand why and what we believe. So the work that Christ has charged us with is too important to not take it seriously. There are times where if we don't have the answers, or if we seem hypocritical in our approach or wobbly in our stance, that we can turn others away from God, and we should never overlook our responsibility as Christian leaders and Christian educators to be prepared. This means that we must spend time learning and growing in God's word. It means that we must embrace our relationship with Jesus Christ and grow closer to God through fellowship, worship, praise, and obedience to his word. This means that when we anticipate opposition, we must be firm enough in our faith not to fall victim to the enemy's attempts to sidetrack us, to distract us, or influence our witness in our faith with mockers who are intentionally making fun of our God and what we believe. The writer lets us know that these are in fact spiritual persons who ignore the work of God in their own lives and have essentially ignored the Holy Spirit and hit and in his work in their lives. Many times we lose our focus and our direction, and the enemy causes us to assume that God has become indifferent or that he ignores our situation. This cannot be farther from the truth. God sees, governs, and controls all things that happens throughout all the creation. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances of life, as believers, we sometimes become distracted or preoccupied with our own things and ignore the will and the voice of God, even when he's speaking clearly to us. The text specifically speaks about those that not only ignore God, but those that make fun of God and that follow uh, in front of the people of God that follow uh, based, uh, based on nothing more than their own insecurities, their misunderstandings, their frustrations, or the worldly perspective that has alienated or distorted their view of Christ. So these people are making fun of our God and we as believers, uh, not because they're just mean and evil people, but again, it's because they are dealing with frustrations uh, uncertainty, 
uh, in their own lives and they don't know how to overcome those situations. Unfortunately, there will be people that don't agree with us, that don't support us, that don't like us, that don't care about us. It is sometimes easier to digest these behaviors when we can identify a wrong that we've done or mistakes that we've made, but it becomes even more frustrating and leaves us bewildered when we don't think we've done anything to create or encourage this, these divisive attitudes and behaviors towards our work and our faith as believers. We must never forget that we are not at war with people or the personal issues in their lives. Instead, we are at war with Satan and the demons that are under his control as he desires to disrupt and upset all that God has, is, and will continue to do in the life of his church. When the spirit of evil overtakes, overshadows, and drowns out the spirit of God in the lives of people, the church must become more diligent in our prayer life and our commitment to God, who gives us the strength to overcome these challenges that we face in life. Like Paul in the fourth chapter of Philippians, verse 13, we must recognize that God has already given us the strength of Christ to overcome all things when we are on the path that God has designed for our lives. That means when we encounter these divisive and uh, behaviors, these uh, haters, if you will, within the body of Christ, internal and external, that God strengthens us according to the power of Christ to have exactly what we need to move forward, to persevere, to stand strong, and to survive these attacks and even find victory over them. So first in our lesson, we have looked to be forewarned is to be forearmed. The second part of our lesson is entitled, Strengthen Your Faith and Commitment. The 20th verse of Jude reads, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So identifying the bond that Jude has with his listeners, he reminds them that they are brothers, co-laborers in the work of Christ, and therefore they have an investment and an interest in the success of each other. One of the things that I really, really love about the ministry here at Friendship is the desire and the recognition of our calling to be a blessing to other believers and answer the clarion call for support and love whenever it's lifted. I have seen uh, Dr. Backus extend resources, his expertise, his wisdom, his experience, and his love to ministries, churches, pastors, and just about anyone who asks for help. Of course, it's not always as simple as writing a check or giving resources, especially when we are dealing with limited resources on our own and we have responsibilities in our own body. But I can't count how many times the Holy Spirit has led people to Dr. Backus and the Friendship Church and they walked away better than the way that they arrived. This reflects Dr. Backus's and our church's recognition that we as believers not only have a commitment to God, but we have a commitment to each other. And I believe the body of Christ would be much better, much stronger, if we weren't so isolated in our work and in our attempts to uh, be a blessing uh, to the people that God has caused us to be around. Uh, one of the themes, or the, the six-year theme for our Baptist General State Convention under the presidency of our president, Dr. Mark McConnell, is laborers together for Christ. His mindset is that in order for us to be successful, that there's no way that we can tackle the challenges and complete the work that God has assigned us independently, but it only is made stronger, our efforts and our attempts to please Christ when we are partnered together. And Dr. McConnell shares a personal testimony how when he was struggling to find his footing at the church where he was serving at, the Holy Spirit uh, led him to organize his own church. He said that he didn't know how he was going to do it or he didn't have the resources to do it right away, and he reached out and asked many people for help and just the support, the love, and the resources just poured in, and he was able to uh, 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 acquire a building, and he has a ministry that's very strong now, one of the strongest churches within our state, our Baptist organization. And so his heart has led him to understand that when we're isolated, when we feel as if we're alone, that's when God enables other believers, and they become the vehicles by which we are blessed and we are given the power, the strength, and the tools to overcome what we're facing. In the same way, God uses us to do the same in other people's lives. We don't understand why we have so much or why we've been blessed, but the uh, old preacher said it best, we're blessed so that we can be a blessing. And God uses us as the vehicles, the tools, the resources to help others in times of uh, discomfort, in times of pain. So Jude identifies the method by which we're able to overcome the issues of divisiveness and division, hatred and jealousy and torment and pain when others attack us simply because of our faith and work of Christ. We can only overcome these things by arming ourselves for battle through prayer. I'm reminded of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 10th through the 18th verse, commonly known as the armor of God, when Paul tells the church in Ephesus to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. 
As we look at each piece of armor, they are all made available to believers through a strengthened fellowship with God and a relationship with him as our father. The keys to success in that relationship is based on two simple things. First, faith in Jesus Christ, who gives us access to God by forgiving our sins and presenting us faultless before him. And secondly, a growing and deepening relationship with God through quality time and fellowship spent with him. We are found not guilty of our sins the moment we give our life to Christ. And due to the fact that he paid the price for our sins and the sins of the world on a cross 2,000 years ago, we are able to grow in Christ and become stronger and more developed and more mature Christians through our understanding and relationship with God the Father. Although there are a myriad of ways that we can interact and speak to and hear from God, our primary source of communication with him is reading his word and talking to him in our prayers. Our only defense against dark forces is growing in our knowledge of God and connecting to him in a much more clear and deepened way through prayer. It is in prayer that we make our requests known to God. It is in prayer that we understand God's will for our lives. It is in prayer that we can identify the hand of God working in our lives through answered prayers. And it is in prayer that we develop a deepened dependence on him that cannot be shaken based on the circumstances of life. So the first part of our lesson is to be forewarned, is to be forearmed. The second part of our lesson is to strengthen your faith and your commitment. And the third part of our lesson is love is key. The 21st verse of Jude reads, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. John chapter 3 verse 16 reminds us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God died, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, as God to die for the sins of this world. Romans 5 6 reminds us that Christ died even for those that were lost and still outside the body of Christ in disbelief. Therefore, this 21st verse of Jude does not instruct us to live a life so that God will love us. Instead, we are instructed to live our lives because God loves us. Again, we are not instructed to live our lives so that God will love us, but we are instructed to live our lives in light that God already loves us. It's one thing to have to earn the love of God. Then we, we would have to be convinced that God's love was worth it, and then we would have to do what it took to get it. Jude, however, reminds believers that God has already given each and every person the fullness of his love, and our response to that already given love should be one of obedience and appreciation. When we earn something, we tend to treat it however we want to, slowly losing interest over time and eventually replacing it with something newer or what we might consider better. Even the things that we deem irreplaceable sometimes diminish over time. However, when it comes to people, our relationships with them is quite different than it is with things. People are irreplaceable, and there are some people in our lives that we simply love without limit, and we don't even understand why. God not only loves us, but he loves each and every one of us unconditionally, not because we've earned it or because we deserve it, but because he is simply that good and that loving. Jude reminds us that our faith is not only based on God's love for us and our commitment to God, but there is a third thing that he identifies as a reason to stay faithful and committed to God, and that third thing is the mercy of Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We, become, we sometimes become so comfortable in this age of grace, this church age that God has blessed us to be a part of, that we don't live in anticipation of the unfinished work of Christ. Now, Jesus was with God before creation. He was sent to this world to be born of a virgin. He lived, died, and rose from the grave, and he ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But that is not how the story ends for believers. One day, according to God's purpose, his timing, and for his ultimate glory, Jesus is coming back for each and every one of us. Jude reminds believers that we should live a life recognizing that even though we don't deserve it, God continues to give us mercy, he continues to block uh, what we deserve, the, the punishment of our sins, uh, based on his promise to love us, his promise to forgive us, and his promise to one day welcome us all into, etern uh, into heaven for all of eternity. When we truly understand and recognize not only what God has done, but what is still in store for us as believers, we can find the perseverance and the reason to remain steadfast and faithful to God even when the world appears to be standing against us. So our response to the work of God and the promise of salvation 
to Jesus' work of presenting us faultless, of keeping us from stumbling, and promising us the gift of eternal life is to keep ourselves literally rooted in a foundation of the love of God that he so freely gives unconditionally to each and every one of us. So the first part of our lesson, again, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. The second part of our lesson, strengthen your faith and your commitment. The third part of our lesson that we just looked at, love is key. But the fourth part of our lesson is a rescue mission. The 22nd and 23rd verses of Jude read, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So Jude now tells believers how we are to deal with individuals that have been obviously distracted in their journey of faith and have turned against the church and its members. Jude makes it clear that these people can fall into two different camps. One group, Jude asks us to have compassion with, realizing that their immature faith has proven to be fertile ground for the enemy to distract and to lead them astray. I often share the story of how when I was in elementary school, right around the time that the movie Malcolm X came out, two of my classmates who were Muslims showed me in the Bible where God commands Israel not to eat pork. I was not interested in becoming a Muslim. In fact, I was a strong Christian from my own perspective. But I actually started to believe, based on what they showed me in God's word, that eat, not eating pork would make me a better Christian. Not only did I change my diet, but I chastised other believers that did not join me on my crusade to be more holy and fully adhere to God's commandments. Thankfully, my pastor, my family, my friends were patient with me, and they realized that I was simply on the wrong path. They prayed for me, fully depending on God's Holy Spirit to correct my misunderstanding and get my faith and understanding of God's word back on track. Thankfully, deliverance for, from these false teachings or this misinterpretation of God's Old Testament law for Israel, it came in the form of the best smelling and the best looking sausage pizza I had ever seen, and the Lord delivered me from this anti-pepperoni spirit that had been dropped into my, in my soul. My story is not isolated, and it's not unique. Many believers who are immature in our faith and have failed to learn and study God's word can easily fall prey to false teachings and misunderstandings of God's word. This is not necessarily an intentional rebellion, but it can be identified as misunderstanding because of lack of knowledge of God's word, God's will, and God's purpose for the lives of his believers. When we encounter situations like this, we should be patient with others and never rush to judge or cast them away, trusting that God has the power to open opportunities for correction through love and a dependence on God's power and the guidance of his Holy Spirit. The second group that Jude identifies are people that are so deep in false teachings that we must literally launch a rescue mission to pull them out. One of my favorite television sitcoms is Monk, a TV de a detective who has extremely eccentric ways. In one of the episodes, Monk goes undercover into a cult, attempting to find out who committed a crime. After just a short period, Monk becomes brainwashed and to be, uh, appears to be fully under the spell of the leader of the cult. When Monk's friends realize how deep off the deep end he has dived, they immediately rescue him and literally lock him in a bedroom, not allowing him to come out until he comes out of the spell of the cult. Monk's friends realize that he was so deep in the cult that they had to go to extreme measures to rescue him from his situation. Through prayer, Jude tells us to operate in fear, not being afraid of what lies ahead, but an urgency, realizing what is at risk, and rescuing those that have been caught in the snares of the devil's attempt to disrupt the work of God through misunderstanding. Not only should we operate with urgency, but we should also operate with caution, recognizing that we could have easily been in the same situation ourselves. It's not because we're so wise or because we've been through so many Christian education classes, but God's power God's strength and the guidance of his Holy Spirit has given us the grace and the mercy to avoid falling into these same traps in our own lives. Again, the battle and the war that we are facing is spiritual, and we must arm ourselves spiritually to overcome the snares of the enemy and the attacks of the devil in our lives. So, again, our lesson we looked at to be forewarned is to be forearmed, to strengthen your faith and commitment that love is the key and the fourth part of our lesson that we just looked at is a rescue mission. 
Finally, our lesson concludes with two simple words, and now. The 24th and 25th verses of Jude reads, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So Jude ends this letter with a doxology, which is commonly used as a benediction in worship services, and he identifies the vehicle and the means by which we have the power to overcome the work of the enemy in our lives. Jude first points out two things that Jesus not only is able to do, but that he continues to do for each and every one of God's children. First, Jesus keeps us from stumbling. I referenced it earlier, but Jesus in John 14 has prayed that we receive a comforter to protect us when, while we're in this world until he returns and we are granted eternal life. We are welcomed into heaven for all of eternity. This gives us the power to not only face the challenges of the world, but to find victory over them. So first, Jesus keeps us from stumbling. Second, Jesus presents us faultless. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, reminding God each and every time that we sin and fall short that he already paid the price for our sins. The work of Jesus not only covers our sins, but he covers them in a way where there's no evidence that those sins were ever present by the time we stand before God. It's just like those three Hebrew boys that came out the fiery furnace not even smelling like smoke. Jesus has a way of jumping in with us, joining us in the midst of our challenges and bringing us out of those sins without the, fet, without the effects of sin tarnishing our presence before God. Now there's a third part to this work, even though it does not directly affect us as believers. It gives us a glimpse into the heart and the mindset that Jesus moves as he completes his work on our behalf. Jesus keeps us from stumbling by defeating death, and he presents us faultless by giving his life. By giving his life, excuse me. But these works are completed on the cross as Jesus took on the sins of the world, even though he was without fault, and gave his life by enduring a horrific execution so that we might have eternal life. Jude reminds us that Jesus does all of this work with extreme joy meaning that he is excited to sacrifice because he knows what is gained through what he gives up. I'm reminded of Christmas holidays. Throughout my life, my parents, and now even Christie's parents, they go out their ways to bless us for Christmas. The gifts that they give are sometimes more than we could ever ask for, and especially now that I understand in a more complete way how finances work. I understand what was sacrificed so that we could be blessed. This, there is no reluctance, there is no hesitation, and oftentimes these gifts are given accompanied with words like we wish we could do more. Even though it costs much, they give it with great joy because they're more focused about what is gained through our appreciation than what has been lost through their sacrifice. Jesus gives us the example of sacrifice and the spirit by which we give of ourselves to accomplish and complete the work that God gives each and every one of us. Even though sometimes it might cost us something, we give, we love, and we sacrifice with extreme joy because what is gained in the lives of others is more than what we could ever give up ourselves. Jude then points to God the Father, reminding us of his wisdom, his love, his power, and his glory. It's a recognition and submission to the attributes of God and his power, recognizing that because we are his children and a part of his church, we have access to what is needed to overcome the challenges that you laid out earlier. We do all of this because God gets all the glory. He has all the majesty, all the dominion, and all the power. It means that we recognize he is fully in control, that he is sovereign, that he has all power over all creation, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So for now and forevermore, an eternal victory that has already begun and has no ending is taking place in the life of all believers. Therefore, when others turn against us, when others mock our faith, when others attempt to tear us down, we don't have to give in, we don't have to give up. We can trust that God has already given us the victory, that God has already shown us he is in control, and that God has already granted us eternal life. So we can be patient with a sense of urgency that we move forward to reveal the love of Christ and the lives of others, remain steadfast in our faith and not give in to the challenges that this world 
sends our way. What an amazing lesson. Again, Jude 24 and 25, two of my favorite verses in the Bible, just reminds me of what God continues to do for me, that even though I continue to fall, I continue to stumble, I continue to make mistakes, that God covers me with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And by the time I'm covered with that blood, when Jesus presents me to God as Father, God don't see nothing but a perfected creature because of my faith and belief in Jesus Christ and because I am a child of God. As always, we thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you have been blessed, that for those of us that believe in Jesus Christ, that we have been encouraged in our faith. For those of us that have yet to give our lives to Christ, that we will continue to plant and water, trusting that God and his Holy Spirit will reveal his love to you in a much deeper way so that you may come running and asking what must you do to be saved and turn your life over to Christ. As always, we want to give you an opportunity to worship with you in your giving. Uh, God has given us so much and goes out his way to bless us even beyond what we deserve. And so we take opportunities to worship him in our giving by thanking him and showing appreciation to support the work of his church and the spread of his gospel ministry. Here at Friendship, we're doing a great work and we encourage you to partner with us in any way that you can. Just a small donation would go a long way for helping us in our effort to be obedient to God's calling in our life and the work that he has given us to do. We have four ways for you to give. You can give on our cash app, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462. Or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. All of those options are on your screen. And if you have already given, we appreciate your sacrifice and your support. And if you have not given to us, we encourage you to find some place of worship, some Christian ministry where they are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, where you can partner with them and to support their efforts as we all seek to deliver the word of God unto the edges of this world. Uh, as always, we encourage you to join us throughout the week. We have so many opportunities for you to worship with us. At 8 a.m. each Tuesday morning, we have intercessory prayer led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson, where we pray for each and every person on our sick and shut-in list, as well for God's will to be done throughout all of creation. The phone number and access code is on your screen. Our laymen meet each Tuesday at 7 p.m. You can reach out to the church under the direction of our layman ministry director, Deacon James Lucas, where they meet on Zoom and have Bible study and discuss issues of life. And then our women of faith uh, with Sister Fowler and our First Lady, Lady Bacchus, they meet the fourth Tuesday of every month. Wonderful group of women that do service projects throughout the year and have their own Bible studies where they seek to accomplish God's work of mission in this church. And then of course, I mentioned earlier, our Bible study is now going on, currently in the book of Galatians, led by our pastor, Dr. Bacchus, a wonderful teaching I believe we're finishing up chapter two right now, and you will be able to join us. You can go back and catch up the beginning of those lessons and just see what God is teaching his church through that epistle of Paul. And then, of course, each and every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we encourage you to join us live in our worship uh, in our worship center here at Friendship in our sanctuary uh, on Laramie and Jackson, or you can join us through Facebook and YouTube and just see uh, some great worship, some great preaching as God continues to bless our church uh, with an awesome man of God and our leader, Dr. Backus. And then if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week, same time, same channel uh, for our Sunday School Lesson Overview. Listen, if you want a more interactive lesson, we have some amazing Sunday School teachers, uh, some amazing Sunday School classes. You'll be able to ask questions. You'll have more examples, more illustrations, uh, a more interactive experience. Reach out to the church. We'll uh, find out uh, what class you're comfortable taking. We have several classes I believe at least one of them will meet your needs. And uh, we encourage you to join us for a more elaborate lesson and not just for this Sunday School lesson overview. But I thank God for your presence, your support, but as always, most importantly, your prayers. If nothing else, we'll dismiss. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for another opportunity to share in your word. We thank you. Uh, that you continue to forgive us of our sins, that you continue to provide us with your word and the power of your Holy Spirit to direct us in the path of righteousness and help us to be more pleasing in your sight in the way that we live our lives. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is continuing to work on our behalf by presenting us from, by, excuse me, by pre uh, preventing us from stumbling and presenting us faultless before your, the presence of your glory. Now, Father, help us to live and operate within the knowledge of those facts. Help us to understand that one day your son, Jesus Christ, is indeed coming back 
for us, and we will be granted access to heaven and eternal life. Until that moment, help us to be lights in the midst of darkness. Help us to be the salt of the earth, that others might see our good works, but glorify you, our Father, who is in heaven. Bless our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. Bless our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams. Bless every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of creation. And bless those that are listening and watching right now, that we might be encouraged in our faith journey according to your purpose for our lives. Uh, now, watch over us until we can meet again, if it's according to your will and purpose. And we'll be careful to give you the glory in all that we say, all that we are, and all that we do. It is in your darling and precious son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you at 11 for worship. And we'll see you next week, same time, same channel, for another Sunday School Lesson Overview. God bless.